Hello everyone and welcome to my talk about the unfolding mechanism within FLIR. My name is Stefan and I want to show you how defects are being treated within the FLIR code. So far you have seen many pristine band structures and also calculated some. But when introducing a defect, one has to build a supercell. So that the neighboring defects are far enough away from each other, as you can see up here. A supercell consists of many pristine unit cells, in this case here, 3 by 3 pristine unit cells of molybdenum deselenide. Once a linium atom from the calcogen layer is replaced by the phosphorus atom. Before being able to calculate the band structure, one has to do a force relaxation to find the relaxed position of the phosphorus atom. Introducing a defect can be interesting so for example, to locally change the electronic landscape and therefore introduce uh, or trap an electron hole pair at this defect. When calculating the band structure of such a supercell, one would expect to have it similar to the pristine one with just a little bit of perturbation. But when you do the calculation, what you actually get is the following. This looks a lot different from the pristine band structure and is hard to interpret because you do not see the same symmetry points as you did for the pristine band structure. Sometimes it can be even hard to tell whether it's a direct or an indirect semiconductor and properties are also hard to inter interpret and understand. So our aim is to relate this band structure back to the pristine band structure with some additional states due to the defect or some altered states due to the defect. So let us start with a simple model to derive how this can work. So what you see here is a very simple quadratic dispersion relation in uh, letters with lattice constant A, but plotted in a supercell of size 2A, meaning that in reciprocal space, the size is half of the original pristine one, 1 over 2a. How can we relate, relate this back to the primitive cell with lattice constant a? Somehow we have to find a way to calculate some spectral weights telling us that this here has no weight or is just a folded version due to the supercell construction of the pristine band structure. In reciprocal space, this simplified picture of a 2 by 2 supercell looks like the following. The pre here, the pristine cells are shown with lattice vectors G1 and G2, meaning if we look at one certain point, it's repeated by the lattice vector G1 or G2 respectively. Re respectively. The related 2 by 2 supercell of the same system has exactly half the length in reciprocal space in the one direction and half the length in the other direction. And a k-point in this supercell is repeated by the lattice vectors G1 and G2, here labeled in capital letters. This means if you would draw all the symmetrically equivalent k-points to this unique one here, you would find all of these here. Looking at the picture of the primitive unit cell, again, one k-point can be related back to this, this k-point in the supercell picture by the lattice vectors capital G1 and G2. But also this one here from the primitive unit cell in reciprocal space is related to the exactly same one. So one can already see that four points from the primitive reciprocal cell relate back to the same point in the supercell. So somehow we need to extract the information of one of these four by finding a way to calculate these weights, exactly as we saw before. A wave function in the plane wave basis is represented by some coefficients c, and the plane waves all summed over all possible g vectors. So now 
to calculate some weight, one could think of the norm of this vector. This is written here. But if we would sum over all possible g's, looking at, for example, for this k-point and summing over all of these g's, one would simply get 1 for the weight, since it is the norm of the vector. But if we restrict this sum to only the subset of g-vectors, such that we only add up the points which we would relate to in the primitive reciprocal cell, we get something which is smaller than 1. Meaning here, we add up only the ones for the g's, which give us this k-point, this k-point, this k-point, this k-point, exactly the way as it would have been for the picture in the reciprocal primitive cell. For another k-point, this would mean we add up b's such that we add up this k-point, this k-point, this k-point, this k-point. But as you already learned, Fleur is using a plane wave basis only in part of the space. The other part includes the Muffin-Tin radii, and within the Muffin-Tin radii, we have spherically symmetric wave functions, such that they already incorporate the 1 over R potential around the atom core. For this now, the whole picture is a little more difficult. But the same weight can be found, or that has to be taken into account for this more complicated basis has to be the overlap matrix for the muffin tint functions such that they can be incorporated. The spectral weights then are still a summation over a subset of the G vectors as described, described before, but including this overlap matrix which is necessary due to the more complex basis. Up here, you see the result for the silicon test case. In gray, you see the band structure of a 2x2 two two supercell of silicon, where silicon looks like a direct band gap semiconductor. But introducing and calculating the unfolding weights, one can relate it back to the pristine structure, and this is exactly the pristine structure, since here no defect has been introduced, and one can again see that it is an indirect band gap semiconductor. Now let us apply this to the MOSE2 with phosphorus doping example that I showed in the beginning. You can now see here very nicely nearly the pristine MOSE2 band structure, but with some additional states at the Fermi level, for instance. Here, this one state from the phosphorus atom is being introduced that can also be seen in the density of states. Phosphorus has only five valence electrons compared to selenium with six valence electrons. So one electron is taken away, so this one state above the Fermi energy can be expected. Additional feature we see is at the level where an atomic state of the phosphorus atom would be and is interacting with the states of the host material, we see these avoided crossings. The stronger the interaction is, the further away the avoided crossing is. This I will show in a moment with a simple model. But first, let us compare it again back to the pristine MOSE2 band structure to prove the point that now we can see the band structure of the supercell with a defect atom as only a small perturbation to the pristine band structure. We can relate all high symmetry points back, for example, here. Photon emission can happen at the k-point, and we can exactly see what the defect does to the band structure and the electronic landscape at the k-point. In the beginning, I briefly mentioned that the supercell size has to be chosen so that the defects do not interact. Here, I show MOS2 with a chromium defect in a 3x3 supercell, and MOS2 with a chromium defect in a 5x5 supercell. In the 5x5 supercell, you see exactly that we are back to the MOS2 pristine band structure, with this additional state closely under the conduction band minimum. For the 3x3 cell, you see this very strong interaction and this dispersion of the defect state due to the interaction. So here again, it's shown that 
a sufficient size of the supercell is necessary in order to model a defect that is not interacting. Here we see an additional feature which is not visible in the band structure of a pristine system. We see this concentration of the weight at some k points related to other k points of the same band. How can we understand this? Let us look at a simple picture with one quadratic dispersion band and an interacting defect state which is plotted very flat. In this plot here, or in this many plots, we show an increasing coupling constant from left to right, meaning the interaction terms become stronger and stronger, and a rising level of the defect state increasing from top to bottom. Here at the top, there are a few EV difference between the minimum of the host state and the defect level, whereas here they are at the same height. We can very nicely see the case we, just seen, we just saw for the MOS2 with chromium here and here, where the weight is being concentrated at some k points, but not all. And we can also see the case that we saw for the MOS2 with phosphorus of these avoided crossings here, which are due to the coupling. Now that we understood how this mechanism works, I want to show how this is implemented in FLUR and how you can use it. So within the input file, there are two lines. One is for the unfolding band, structure and according input, and one is the flank you already know, which you need to set the band structure to true, and where you need to set the path to the path where you, the, along which you want to calculate the band structure. The unfolding flag is automatically introduced, and you just have to set it to true if you want to additionally to the norm band structure calculate the unfold band structure and then include the supercell size. So for example, for the cell I showed in the beginning, 3 by 3 MOSE2 with phosphorus, you would put a 3 and a 3 here. Here we see again the example for MOS2 with a chromium defect and see how unfolding helps to understand the structure and helps to see the backfolded band structure as a perturbation to the pristine structure and how much more helpful it is to interpret the backfolded band structure rather than the not backfolded band structure where you see only a whole pile of spaghetti, let's call it. Unfolding the structure also shows a result as it would be expected in the ARPES experiment because the ARPES experiment does not rely on any supercell construction or any theoretical way of, th of thinking. It relies on the direct properties of the material. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will have fun calculating, calculating defects and unfold band structures.